So after a little over 18 years of marriage, I am proud to say that I've figured a few things out about my wife. Now, I was thinking about this morning. I was uh, actually just listening to the, the Genesis account. And I just, I realized something, that there's a reason why men don't understand women. It's because God made y'all while we were sleeping, okay? <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed, like, oh, he put Adam to sleep. That makes all the sense in the world why this is so hard, you know? You know, but the, uh, the, you know, the old adage, happy wife, happy life, right? That is a gospel truth, right? That's a, it's in the Bible somewhere. If, if it's not, it should be. Uh, so there are a few things that make my wife really, really happy. All right, a few things that make her really happy. Uh, one thing Amy likes is she loves to travel. She loves to travel. There's nothing better than seeing the look on her face when we board a plane. It's just the best thing. It's, it's so great. Another thing Amy loves is Amy loves to be able to sit down and eat a meal prepared for her that she didn't prepare herself. <laughs> Uninterrupted, all right? Any moms in the house that know what she's talking about, okay? Loves that. She loves it. Another thing Amy loves is Amy loves a really good movie, okay? Anytime we're about to watch a movie she's been waiting to see, she gets almost giddy. It's, it's hilarious just to see it. She gets really giddy. Now, the unfortunate thing for Amy is that she's married to a man who, if, if I stay still for too long, I fall asleep. I'm that guy who can fall asleep in a movie theater. Why, like, an action movie, I can fall asleep. Like, it's really, really bad. I'm that guy. That's right. I turn on movies so I can fall asleep, right? Like, like I don't watch movies movies watch me, <laughs> right? Not only that, with Amy, she can't turn a movie off. She has to watch a movie from beginning to end. It pains her to turn the TV off. So we start a movie, I'm asleep five minutes in, and she's up late. That's sometimes why we don't watch movies is because she's like, I'm gonna be up all night and you're not, so no, right? <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, she, can't, she cannot have like unresolved tension in her head, right? Meanwhile, you know, I have like thousands and thousands of unresolved plot lines and stories in my head, and it's great. It's, it's wonderful. It's, it's so good. It's great. All right. So now that you have this insight, uh, imagine the scene of us trying to watch a movie a few weeks ago. Uh, and it sh shouldn't surprise you also that Amy loves Christmas movies. She loves Christmas movies, and I despise them. <laughs> I don't even let my kids, okay, this is probably a little bit on the side, but I don't even let my family turn on Christmas music until after Thanksgiving. Am I, am I alone on that? <laughs> a clap, a clap. All right. Let's pass the offering buckets around again. I think they're, I think they're here now. Uh, yeah, there's something, I, Christmas movies is just not it for me. They're just not. I, I, you've seen one, you've seen them all. Christmas rom-coms, it's like the same story, just different characters. Opinion, it's opinion, all right? Some of y'all looking at me really not, it's okay, we're in church. It's a safe place, okay? Uh, but, you know, on this particular night, you know, I want to make my wife happy. And so we try to find a Christmas movie, and I'm scrolling through all of our streaming apps, just trying to find a Christmas movie. And I'm like 30 minutes in. You've been there. 30 minutes in, trying to find a movie, I can't find one. Finally, we settle on a non-Christmas movie. And Amy's so irritated that it's like, this will do. Let's just, let's just turn it on. <laughs> and so I turn on this movie called Love and Monsters. Now, I'm not promoting this movie. Matter of fact, I think it's PG-13, which means parents strongly cautioned, viewer discretion advised, all right? But, uh, you know, the, the, like the way, the way I'm wired is if you can get me to actually stay awake during a movie, all I see in any movie I watch are the gospel implications. I just see the gospel story. I, in any movie I watch, I can see the fall of man, I can see the redemption of man. I can see new creation. That, that's all I see. Like I'm constantly watching movies and like, oh, that's, that's Jesus. 
oh, that's in the Bible. You know, I, that's just what I do. And so we, we watch this movie and, and as we're watching it, I'm like, well, Amy, look, looks like we did find a Christmas movie. It's like the Christmas story is right here. And she's like, what? And, and here, here's what this movie is about. So uh, the destruction of an asteroid headed for earth releases something in the atmosphere that causes cold blooded animals to mutate into these ferocious <laughs> killer monsters that then wipe out most of humanity. <laughs> All right. And then, yeah, and then I fall asleep on these things to Amy, it's fun, right? But then we're introduced to a young man named Joel who falls in love with this girl, but they get separated during the apocalypse and all he does is dream about being reunited with her and they're in like these separate colonies far away from each other. And so he begins as an undervalued, underappreciated, ministrony-making member of his colony. But then, by the end of the movie, because of an, a lot of ill-advised risks that he takes to go to this girl, uh, he has to face this crazy, dangerous world. And he goes, uh, and, and everyone who's hiding and underground, because of his brave, they all have a breakthrough. Because he braves this new world, he courageously uh, empowers everyone to bravely now go face their new world. Christmas. Yeah? Just as much as Die Hard's a Christmas movie. And all the men said, amen. All right. And so what began in this movie as a feeling from Joel of, I don't want to die all alone at the end of the world. And a, and a pronouncement to his colony that I'm done waiting for things to get better. It's time to take matters into my own hands. Sent him on this adventure and, and I was hooked. I actually did stay awake for this one. I, I was hooked. And so I think the reason why we love stories like this is because it reminds us of our story. You know, the greatest stories are just traces of a greater story that God has been writing from all of eternity. See, Christmas is about the greatest story ever told. The lover of our souls. It's about the lover of our souls carrying out the riskiest part of his plan to save the world by coming to us in the flesh and trusting us to care for him in the most vulnerable form. Uh, the prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years before his arrival, said, uh, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign, and behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. A little bit later, Isaiah goes, goes on to say, uh, that for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Paul would later echo this familial language when he said this in Galatians 4. He said, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. We are at the end of a short Advent series that we've been calling the Holy Family, All right? Uh, Christmas means that God is making us part of his Holy Family and he does so by entrusting us with his son. If I'm honest, um, I think Jesus is sometimes treated as these, this undervalued, underappreciated, ministrony making, I'll call you when I need you member of our community, but he's much more than that, much, much more than that. And so today, what I want to do is I want to look at the wonder, the weight, and the wisdom of Jesus as a member of our family. Amen. See, Mary and Joseph were asked to birth and steward the will of God. And that is exactly what we're being asked to do as believers. All right. So you guys ready to go on this ride with me? You good? All right. So first, let's look at the wonder. Okay. The wonder. Uh, incarnation is the word used to describe the act of Jesus, the King of heaven, the God of all creation coming in human forms. It, it literally means the act of being made flesh, right? And, and it's quite unbelievable if you think about it. Uh, J.I. Packer said that once the incarnation is grasped as a reality, all other misbelief and difficulty with the gospel story dissolves. See, God, the unrestrained, unlimited one, wrapped himself in humanity and as 
the book of Philippians said, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. Jesus came, as Aaron said to us, he came to us. Jesus came to us. Do you know the cost of that? Do you know the distance traveled? Let's do an exercise. Um, raise your hand if you're married in the room. If you're, if you're married, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, uh, keep your hand up. Keep your hand. Okay. This won't hurt you. All right. Keep your hand up. All right. Keep your hand up if you've been married longer than 15 years. So if you've been married for less than 15 years, you can put your hands down. But if you're married longer than 15 years, keep your hand up. Okay. 20 years. Keep your hand up. All right. 30 years. Keep your hand up. All right. 40 years. Wow. Y'all old. <laughs> so that was my in-laws. 45 years? 50 years? Okay, so we got a lot of married folks in the room. Okay, good job, guys. I think you guys won. You guys are our heroes. Now listen, now there's a, there's a reason why you can be more in love for, for those of us who've been married for a long time, you'll understand this. You can be more in love with your spouse decades and decades after your wedding date. All right, there's a reason why, right? It's because of the distance traveled, isn't it? It's the distance traveled. In marriage, you and I say, I surrender all of my personal wants and desires and I prioritize us over me. I love Amy now more than I did on our wedding day. And there's many reasons why, but for me, it's the distance traveled that she's still here. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> she's still here. Right? Right? When we said I do 19, almost 19 years ago, uh, you know, for us, what we understand and what those of you who've been married for a long time is I do didn't mean I'm done. Right? But we have to say I do every day. Every, and some days are easier than others. Right? Every day. All right. And so when you think about the incarnation, it ought to evoke amazement and wonder in us. Uh, Dorothy Sayers, she said it this way. She said, the incarnation means that for one reason, God chose to allow us to be limited, to suffer, and to be subject to sorrows and death. He has nonetheless had the honesty and courage to take his own medicine. He can ask nothing from us that he has not exacted from himself. He has himself gone through the whole human experience from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and the lack of money to the worst horrors of pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. He was born in poverty. He died in disgrace. He suffered infinite pain all for us and thought it was well worth his while. When we think about incarnation, it ought to evoke amazement and wonder in us. You know, the, the incarnation means he came, which is enough for us to meditate on. But let's take it further, because not only did Jesus come, Jesus came to a family. He came to a family. Now think about this. If you were God to a family, he came to a family. Now think about this. If you were God and you had a plan to save the world by coming to the world, how would you come? How would you come? Would you surf on a cloud as a spectacle, right? Just to let everyone know how bad you are, All right? Well, bad meaning good in this context, right? What would you do it that way? Would you, would you King Kong it? Would you just start walking through cities and, and areas, just letting everyone know how powerful you are? Wouldn't you at least be a strategist about it, right? Wouldn't you at least uh, entrust yourself to a palace, right? To the elite, right? To, to the people with the most influence. Wouldn't you do it at least that way so that you can spread your message? How would you come? How would you come? God did none of that. He came to a family, a, a poor Middle Eastern family, a poor Middle Eastern family that were a nation that wasn't sovereign. Okay, they were conquered. They were living under Roman oppression. That's how he came. And so miracle is probably the best word to describe how a baby born in that environment could grow up to be worshipped by his own people, much less by all of us thousands of years later. Miracle is probably the best word 
right? And so the wonder of the incarnation is that Jesus came, uh, but then he came to a family, uh, but then he came to a family as a baby, a weak, vulnerable, reliant baby. Can you imagine changing God's poopy diaper? Can you imagine teaching the living word, the word made flesh, how to form words and formulate words and to talk, to pray even? Can you imagine teaching the creator of all creation, the architect of all things, how to do carpentry? See, coming to us as a baby has to be the wildest idea, but there's another way to look at this because the Wall Street Journal uh, published an article on Christmas Eve last year by actually by a, a Catholic bishop, and I think it's fascinating. So this is a long read, but I think it's helpful. All right, so I'm gonna read this to you. It says this, it says, babies bring peace and joy. It's just what they do. The central and still unnervingly strange message of Christmas is that God became a baby. The omnipotent creator of the universe, the ground of the intelligibility of the world, the source of finite existence, the reason there is something rather than nothing became an infant too weak even to raise his head, a vulnerable baby lying helpless in a manger where the animals eat. In this, we see a stroke of divine genius. For the entire length of the history of Israel, God was endeavoring to attract his chosen people to himself and to draw them into deeper communion with one another. The whole purpose of the Torah, the Ten Commandments, the dietary laws outlined in the book of Leviticus, the preaching of the prophets, the covenants with Noah and Moses and David, and the sacrifices offered in the temple was simply to foster friendship with God and greater love among his people. A sad but consistent theme of the Old Testament is that despite all these efforts and institutions, Israel remained alienated from God. Tor ignored, covenants broken, commandments disobeyed, temple corrupted. So in the fullness of time, God determined not to intimidate us in order, uh, in order us for, uh, for on high, but rather to come become a baby. For who can resist a baby? At Christmas, the, at Christmas, the human race no longer looked up to see the face of God, but rather down into the face of a little child. So where do we find the God we seek? We do so most clearly in the faces of the vulnerable, the poor, the helpless, the childlike. It is relatively easy to resist the demands of the wealthy, successful, and self-sufficient. In point of fact, we're likely to, re to feel resentment toward them. But the lowly, the needy, the weak, how can we turn away from them? They draw us as a baby does out of our self-preoccupation and into the space of real love. I would invite you to remember that the reason you are gathering at all is to celebrate the baby who is God. And finally, permit yourself to be attracted by the peculiar magnetism of that divine child. He came. He came to a family and he came as a baby. When we think about the incarnation, it ought to evoke, guys, amazement and wonder. Amen. So that's the wonder. Secondly, let's look at the weight. The weight. Now, once uh, Mary and Joseph got past the wonder of being entrusted with this God child, all of the weight and pressure began to settle in. Right? It didn't take long at all for them to see the overwhelming cost of this blessing or blessing right, that the angel spoke of. Everyone who's had a baby understands the great responsibility and burden that comes with caring for a baby. Right, probably the understatement of the year is that having a baby will change your life. Amen. Pre preach. The, the dad in the front row. All right. Having a baby will change your life. All right. But for Mary and Joseph, Jesus didn't just change their life. It almost cost them their life. Right. Uh, in, in the movie uh, Love and Monsters, there's this, uh, there's this moment where Joel, he finds this dog named Boy, all right? And Boy, at one point in the movie, saves Joel from a monster that's pursuing him and trying to kill him. But then there's this other moment in the movie where Joel saves Boy from a monster pursuing him and trying to kill him as well. And so 
uh, all in a small matter of time, he saves his dog's life and the dog saves his life. And I think parenting can be that way. Amen. That sometimes we as parents are acutely aware of the fact that we are saving these little crumb snatchers' lives, right? <laughs> but every now and then we have these moments where it's like, man, I think they're saving me, yeah? I mean, think about, think about just the, the burden of, can, can I just become a real parent for a second? The burden of raising kids. Do you know how much it costs <laughs> to raise a kid in our nation? From, from birth to age 18, do you know how much it costs? I looked it up. A lot. A lot. Okay. To raise a child from birth to age 18 in our country costs about, it costs about 240 grand. 240 grand. All right. And I have four children, so I have a million dollar investment in my house. Okay. <laughs> million dollar investment. All right. All right. Now, think about the emotional and social cost to Mary and Joseph. All right, when Mary said to the angel, may it be unto me as you have said, you know what she was really saying? She was saying, may I be disgraced. That's what she was saying. Because Mary spent the rest of her life being known by her community as a fornicator who had a baby out of wedlock. All right, how do I know that? It's because later on in Jesus' life, when he went back to his hometown to preach, he started his ministry, went back to Nazareth, they rejected him. And you know what they said? They said, oh, wait, wait. Isn't this Mary's son? Is what they said. Almost certainly they were referring to the fact that he had been born out of wedlock. Right? They saw him and said, no, no, there's no way you can be the savior of the world. Right? We know your mama. We know. Get out of here with all that kingdom of God stuff. Right? That's how she was known. For Joseph, his plans were, complete, had, uh, were completely shifted. Even with the confirmation from an angel, he knew that he would be rid a ridiculed second-class citizen for the rest of his life. You know, and I, I just wonder how many of us would walk away from the faith if it meant, if, if walking with Jesus meant being un, misunderstood and ridiculed for the rest of our lives. See, for Joseph, it took trust and obedience. But if you look at his story, by the end of Matthew chapter one, think about this. By the end of Matthew chapter one, Joseph takes Mary as his wife, but just one chapter later, all right, one chapter later, Matthew chapter two, Joseph will find out that having Jesus in his life means not just damage to his social standing, but also danger to his very life, all right? And so the angel said to Joseph, she will bear a child and you will name him Jesus, all right? So not only was he misunderstood, ridiculed and running for his life, but he couldn't even name his own son. Even his control of his family was being undermined, right? And so this is what the angel was saying when he said that to, to Joseph. The angel was saying, if Jesus is in your life, you're not his manager. He's your manager. See, if you say, I want to be a Christian, but not if being a Christian means I have to do this or that, then you know what you're trying to do? You're trying to name the baby. You're trying to name the baby, right? You're saying, I want Jesus, but on my terms. But if you're gonna have Jesus in your life, you don't control him, he controls you. I mean, are, are there any, thinking about Joseph here, are there any stepfathers in the room that understand how hard it is to control your stepchildren, right? You don't have to raise your hand, it's okay, we love you. But matter of fact, this is hard even if they're not, you're not a step parent, right? But last week we saw the weight of this baby. So not just, not just on Mary and not just on Joseph, but we even saw it last week on King Herod, right? The Magi comes to his city. They come to the king of the Jews asking where the newborn king of the Jews is. And so for Mary, this baby was a sacrifice. For Joseph, it was an inconvenience, but for Herod, it was a threat. And so as much as Jesus ought to evoke wonder in us, there's a true weight to hosting his presence. See, the main characters in the Christmas story understood this. And so we looked at the wonder. Um, we looked at the weight of having Jesus as a member of our family. And lastly, we're gonna look at the wisdom. We'll invite our, our worship team back up.
We're going to respond in worship in a moment. But let's look at the wisdom here, and I'll make this, I'll make this quick. So in Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom is depicted as an actual person with whom God created the world. Um, All throughout Proverbs, you see God's wisdom personified as a woman whom we know, uh, a woman whom we must know personally if we're to live a wise life. But then later in the New Testament, in Luke 7, Jesus would say, and I love how this reads in the NIV, Jesus says this in Luke 7, he says, wisdom is proved right by all her children. Wisdom is proved right by all her children, right? Which is to say, that I'm going to do things in your life and in the world that often will not look like a finished product. Stay with me. God's saying, I I will do things in your life that often will not look like a finished product. See, no one tells us, you know, that when you're walking around full-term pregnant and you can't sleep and you're walking with a waddle, your skin is stretched beyond repair, right? And then, and then eventually you have to raise this thing. You have to feed it. You have to clothe it. You have to shelter it just so that it can grow up and say all kind of out-of-pocket, disrespectful, ungrateful stuff. <laughs> See Patterson Girls stage. I'm just kidding. But no one tells us that like, if you can just hold on and honor God, like they actually like grow up to be pretty decent human beings, right? No one tells us, hey, Matt, thank you. Thank you, Fred, right? No one tells us that, right? And so if you say yes to stewarding the will of God, he will regularly give you things in seed form. And if you trust him and water that thing and shepherd that thing, wisdom will be proved right, be proven right. I mean, do you remember what the angel said to Mary? The angel said, hail Mary, you are highly favored. You know, sometimes favor looks like God speaking to you and calling you blessed right before your life is turned upside down, right? The angel said, hail Mary, and then what happened? She went through hell. (laughs) See, life as a believer is paradoxical. If you're not asking if the struggle is worth it every now and then, you're probably not doing it right. But never forget, we as believers walk by faith, not by sight, amen. No matter how things look right now, if you are committed to caring for all God calls you to steward, wisdom will be proven right by the children, by the fruit it produces in your life. And so this is the Christmas story. Individually, And as a church, we are being asked to care for something so precious and delicate. It will require intentionality and it will require us doing this together. I don't know about you, but when I think about being entrusted with something so important, it can cause a lot of anxiety, right? Unless you realize that Jesus is more committed to getting to you than you are to getting to him. Sometimes we fail to approach him in wonder, don't we? Sometimes we are apathetic. Sometimes we are unimpressed. Sometimes the weight is too much and we drop it, don't we? Sometimes we just can't wait for the seed to become fruit and we fail to trust in God's wisdom. It happens, right? And I know we're, you know, we're not in an apocalypse Right? We're not running for our lives, hiding from mutated bugs and insects, but deep down, I think we all know that we carry a terminal illness called sin and it is sure to kill us if we don't deal with it. And so the only way that you and I can truly appreciate the wonder, the weight, and the wisdom of God's presence among us, his distance traveled, if you will, is to realize that Jesus is love we're the monsters. I thought that was going to land better. Like in my head, I was like, when I say this, boom. All I got was fist pump from Brandon in the corner. Moving on. 
God is inviting us into his holy family. Thank you, Lene. He's inviting us into his holy family. But to say yes to this invitation will require sacrifice. You'll have to endure inconvenience and you will have to welcome his rule rather than see it as a threat. That's what this whole series has been about. And so how do I know that this is an invitation to do this as a family? Thanks for asking, let me tell you. Because of coming as a baby to a poor Middle Eastern couple isn't enough. Consider the fact that at the end of his life, Jesus would be found in the Garden of Gethsemane repeating the prayer of his mother. Remember to the angel, Mary said, may it be unto me as you have said, right? But Jesus would echo later that same prayer at the end of his life when in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before he went to the cross, he said, not my will, but yours be done. And like his stepfather, who is mostly silent in scripture, but who gave his life to building constructs that comforted and protected families for generations, Jesus would one day silently hang on a cross to do the same. And so like Joel in Love and Monsters, Jesus said, I'm done waiting for things to get better. It's time for me to take matters into my own hands. But in order to do this, he would have to do the very thing Joel feared the most. He was gonna have to die all alone. He did that for us, amen. And so we're gonna respond in worship. Our team is gonna sing a song for us. Why don't you stand with us as we do this?